G'day there guys, imagines himself having invisibility or flying to distract himself from the inevitability of death while trying to fall asleep here. It's your host Marky and welcome back to another episode of r slash am I the a-hole. Now if you love today's content, I want you to sit back, relax, enjoy the show and tell me what you thought about it down in the comments. Thank you. Posted by user Milo U Truth, titled... Am I the a-hole for moving all of my stuff to my guest room after my husband refused to stop turning the light on at 3am? My husband just got promoted to shift manager three weeks ago. This meant that his 10am to 6pm shift has now been switched 4am to noon. He isn't a morning person at all, so most mornings he will start huffing and puffing as soon as his alarm goes off and he will instantly turn on our light and very loudly start looking for his work clothes. I have asked him several times to put clothes out the night before, and he has yet to do so. I have also asked him to not turn the light on or be super loud. After all, when I worked at 5am, I made sure to be respectful of him sleeping. So yesterday morning when he got up at 3am and flipped on the light, I grabbed my stuff and went to the guest room. He came in and asked what I was doing. I told him that since he didn't respect me sleeping at all, that I would be staying in the guest room from now on. He made a comment about the light will only be on for five frickin' minutes, which is not true. He turns the light on, finds himself clothes, then goes to take a shower without turning the light off. If I turn the light off, he will come back into the room after the shower and turn it on again to grab his socks and put on his shoes which also pees me off because shoes stay in the kitchen by the door and there's no reason he can't put them on at the table. Anyways, instead of understanding, he just got angry, mainly because he's not a morning person and doesn't like dealing with anything in the AM. So while he was at work yesterday, I moved all my stuff into the guest room. Last night, he practically begged me to sleep in the bedroom and promised to let me sleep. Well... This morning he flips on the fudging light again, so I sit up and I'm like, are you kidding me right now? And he says, I'm being quiet, as if that was the only issue. So I went into the guest room and locked the door. I told him I was staying in here from now on, despite his efforts to sway me. He thinks I'm overreacting. Am I the a-hole? Edit for the trolls of Reddit. I do in fact work. So your assumption that I don't is not only misled, but pretty ignorant. Also, the assumption that everything I have is due to my husband working, another ignorant statement. Not that it matters for the context of this post, but I work 4pm to midnight. And cute little tidbit, I'm the breadwinner. I make nearly 5 bucks more on my hourly wage. Take that info and shove it. I'm on your side for this one. I'm going to say not the a-hole. That's basically torture in a way. I wouldn't like to be continually woken up and then seemingly gaslighted by this man or have him be angry at me that I want to go sleep in another room because he continually disrupts my sleep. The fact that he's getting angry at you, his partner, and not understanding is a cause for concern. You've tried to be open and communicative with him, and he's not communicating with you properly, or he's too thick to understand what he's doing is wrong, and his solutions aren't solutions, they're just excuses. It's going to take a bit more tough love and sleeping in that guest room for him to understand what he's done wrong. I think just more communication and more talking it out would probably solve this one, but for the way it currently is, you're not the a-hole for moving all your stuff. If you need sleep, that's what you gotta do. Not the a-hole? He is being completely disrespectful. Honestly, if he can't get up in the middle of the night without waking his partner, he should be the one sleeping in the guest room. But since he seems to be completely inconsiderate, I recommend you stay there. You were not overreacting, not even a little. Agree. Sounds a bit childish about having to wake up early. What time does he go to bed? Don't you have some awake time where you need the light on too? Maybe time to run the blender or vacuum. You both can agree to live in a state of mutual disregard for sleep and disregard for reasonable requests, or he can just put his clothes out the night before, not in the bedroom, and be a person that respects his spouse. What is hard about this? Okay, uh, you don't do any of this? Lol, <laughs> run the blender or vacuum? Lamau, passive aggressive games, F that. 
What relationship do you people have? Tell him he's being an immature partner. Sleep in the other room immediately, no questions asked. After a day or two when he asks you to come back, give him one, and I mean one more chance. Yes, months later accidents happen. And then if he blows you off, find yourself a new partner dude. Sleep is one third of your life that you are sharing. If there is disrespect here, there is disrespect everywhere and you haven't realized it yet. This. You don't try to get even in a relationship. You are one unit, and passive-aggressive mind games only hurt long-term trust. If there's disrespect there, there is disrespect everywhere, and you haven't realized it yet. It took me a long time to realize that, but it really can show how disrespectful someone is. When you turn your alarm off as quickly as possible, slide out of bed, tiptoe to the closet, close the closet door, and then turn the light on, but your significant other is so loud at night when playing his video games, to the point where you can understand what he's saying from the bedroom with a big and loud fan blowing, chances are there was a big disconnect of respect everywhere else. My first husband was a dick at night, even if it was me going to get a baby bottle. He had an, I'm the man, don't dare wake me attitude. Okay, I'll tell the baby, please wait till your dad is up before you cry. My second husband, however, has trouble sleeping at night, and he is so super careful to tiptoe. Sometimes I've woken up when he gets out of bed to him literally tiptoeing, and he's super apologetic if he does wake me. He really does try his best to be quiet. Much better, more respectful marriage the second time around. Posted by user, Am I the A-hole throwaway 566? Titled, Am I the A-hole for demanding my fiancé and his mum to pay for a new wedding address? Me, 26 female, and my fiancé, 28 male, have been engaged for four months. We're planning on having our wedding on October 18th. My future mother-in-law kept annoying me and sending me suggestions for choosing the right wedding dress and said that she knew better and tried to get me to approve of wedding dresses that she chose. And when she couldn't enforce her decision, she demanded that I take her with me to buy my wedding dress so she could have an opinion. Before I went shopping, I called her to ask if she wanted to come but started making excuses about how busy she was with my sister-in-law. I went shopping with my mum and I was able to find a really nice dress although it cost me a little over what I saved up for, but it was worth it. I made some changes to it, and it was perfect. It arrived to my apartment at the end of the week. I made sure it was stored in a safe place so it doesn't get ruined. Yesterday, I got back from my mum's house, and found out that my fiancé wasn't home, and neither was the dress. I called him immediately, knowing that he must have taken it to show his mum, since she continuously asked to see it, and refused to have me send her pictures of it on Facebook. I was so mad when it was confirmed that my fiancé took it to show to his mum. He said he was going to be home in 30 minutes, after he went to the supermarket. I waited for longer than I had to, and then when he arrived, I ran to get my dress that was buried underneath grocery bags. I took it to check on it, and its zipper was broken, and the dress itself, the fabric, was stretched out. I was like, what the F happened to it? My mother-in-law must have tried it on because it looked ruined. The straps were almost loose, and I had to call my mother-in-law when my fiancé told me that his mum and sister took turns to try it on. I was absolutely livid. She told me she did nothing wrong and that I was making a big deal out of it. She said she would get a replacement for the broken zipper, but I told her to pay for a new dress since it was stretched out and no longer fitting. She refused and said that I probably wasn't happy with my dress choice and wanted to her to pay so that I could get a new one. I yelled at her for trying it on and ruining it, that she and my fiancé were responsible for ruining my dress so they should pay for a new one. It's done. No longer fitting, the straps are in a horrible condition. My mum said she would pay for fixing it, but I just hate it now that someone else wore it before me. I'm mad at both of them and seriously considering postponing the wedding. Look, I genuinely can't blame you for being mad that they both took turns with your wedding dress. That's some serious disrespect and I would consider, you know, 
maybe not inviting them to the wedding for that one. I feel like that's a big enough offense that they've crossed a line that much that I wouldn't want them at my wedding for that. And I would definitely postpone the wedding for that. Jesus. I'd question your husband too for letting him have the wedding dress under all the grocery bags. There's just so many things wrong in this story. I really feel like you need to take a step back and reassess your priorities here. But whatever the case, I'm going to go with not the a-hole for this one. Not the a-hole? Girl, do you hear yourself? Your fiancé took your wedding dress without permission and allowed multiple people to try it on. Do you understand how disrespectful and inappropriate that is? You not only have a bad mother-in-law problem, you have a huge fiancé problem. Needless to say, I'd be doing more than postponing. Yes, I'm aware of how awful and wrong this is. I'm just stunned. Who wouldn't be upset by what they did? Who would want to wear a dress that was worn before? I hate even looking at the dress now, despite the fact that I admired it so much and was so happy I found it. I'm heartbroken and I feel so bad for even leaving it at the apartment. I would consider actually postponing the wedding or even cancelling it unless your future mother-in-law, sister-in-law and fiancé all pay for a new dress. Or even better, dump your fiancé completely. What they did was bloody outrageous. I'm actually mad for you. 100% agree? Who the hell does something like that? This is wrong on so many levels. I can't even with them. Definitely start shopping for a new fiancé. That was my immediate thought. The fiancé is just as guilty, if not more so, for his part in this. I'd recommend moving out and small claims court to get the cost of the dress back. This sets a scary precedent for what OP could be put through after being married if fiancé and in-laws already show no respect. You don't need a new dress, you need a new fiancé. Not the a-hole. This, fiancé is as much to be blamed, if not more, than mother-in-law. Waited for OP to be absent so he could take the dress because he knew she wouldn't be okay with it. And now he doesn't even acknowledge that it is his and his mother's responsibility to pay for the damage. You deserve someone better, OP. Posted by someone that deleted their account. Titled... Am I the a-hole for not letting my sister have custody of her bio kids who I adopted? When my sister Annie was 18 and I was 21, she got pregnant and had a daughter, Sophie. She developed what we believe was postpartum depression, but was never diagnosed as she refused therapy. When Annie's school started up again, our mother took on all childcare of Sophie. As mum took on more childcare, Annie seemed more like her old self. Happy, outgoing, generally mentally healthy. Then within six months of Sophie's birth, Annie got pregnant again with another girl, Laura. And the cycle of PPD symptoms, mum taking over, and Annie's mood improving repeated. When Laura was two and Sophie was three, Annie decided to move out of the parents' home, alone, and said she wanted our parents to adopt and raise her daughters. They said no. Annie said she couldn't take care of the girls as she had her own life and being a parent made her miserable. My husband and I already had four kids of our own. We had bonded with the girls and we had the resources for two more. So we offered to take them in and Annie let us legally adopt them before moving about eight hours away. It's been about five years and the kids are doing well. It was a rough start, but we're now a stable, loving, healthy family unit. Sophie and Laura are seven and eight, and Annie has recently lost her job and had to move back in with our parents. Annie now has asked for custody of Sophie and Laura. I'm writing custody like that because it wouldn't be custody in the legal sense, as she willingly surrendered all legal rights to the girls and can't get them back. We checked with a lawyer. However, Annie wants the girls to live with her. Initially, she said she wanted them full-time and to legally adopt them back from us, which we obviously refused. Then she offered a compromise of alternate weeks, so 50-50 custody. Again, we refused. Given her insistence, we don't even want her around Sophie and Laura, so we've not been going by my parents' house as we typically do. It's been a month of constant badgering, insisting we let Annie bond with her daughters and allow her to at the very least take them for overnight visits, 
saying that Annie had PPD five years ago, and now she's ready to be a parent. I've responded that we are not babysitters. We are Sophie and Laura's parents, they are in a good place, and this will be detrimental to all six kids. And Annie doesn't get to step in now when she's never stepped up in the first place. The response from my parents and Annie is that I'm being unsympathetic to her PPD, and I should let her at least have a chance, rather than deem her unfit without giving her a chance to prove herself. Plus, given that we already have four kids other than them, Sophie and Laura could probably do with a smaller household, and saying we're being unreasonable for not allowing Annie to bond with her kids. Am I the crazy one here? How do the parents raise these two daughters of their own, their whole life, understand what these two are like, and still give in to the fantasy of this Annie? Annie is living in a fantasy. She's just coming out of nowhere now and saying, all right, I'm ready to take the kids in again, take them away from the family unit they've been used to, and um, let's put them back with me and see how this goes. You are genuinely delusional if you think that that's going to work, Annie, and the parents are delusional too for buying into this. You signed over your daughters five years ago. You've had five years to show that you could potentially come back into their life, yet where have you been for five years? If it were me in this situation, I'd say give it another five years of showing that you're worth having these kids back in your life, unfortunately, because you abandoned them for all intents and purposes. I think you have to earn that trust back, and I think Opie is not the a-hole for not letting her see the kids. Not the a-hole, not the a-hole, not the a-hole, not the a-hole, and please stand your ground. You have provided those two little girls with a stable, loving family for the last five years. You are genuinely the only true mom and dad they've ever experienced, and it is so unfair of your sister and parents to expect you to relinquish custody of your daughters, whom you have raised without any support or help from Annie. PPD is totally possible, but even with PPD, had Annie adopted the children outside of your family, not only would she have absolutely zero custodial rights to them, but she wouldn't even know them whatsoever. Being a parent is not something to get to be wishy-washy about. Not the a-hole, all of the above. Plus, it appears that the reason that Annie is now ready to be a full-time mum is that she has lost her job, doesn't appear to have a new role coming up, and is living rent-free off her parents. I've been to this picture show, and this is how it turns out. Annie takes two very confused and unhappy children to your parents' house. She plays mummy for a few months and gets bored. A new interest comes into the picture, usually a man. Annie no longer wants to babysit because she wants to be with her new boyfriend. Your parents ask you to resume your care of the girls. The girls are now emotionally damaged by abandonment issues, both because their parents, you, left them there, and the woman claiming to be their mother has left again. You will spend years trying to help them with these issues. Please stick to your guns. Your daughters are very vulnerable right now, and they need your stability and love. Spot on. Bravo. Not only not the a-hole, you're a hero, and stand your ground. They are your children, you saved them. Annie abandoned them. There's no reason to deviate an inch from continuing on that path. Posted by user, library card have fun. Titled... Am I the a-hole for telling a friend he shouldn't get a job in a field he wants and that his attitude is horrible? I, female 27, am a librarian at an inner city location. One of the most fundamental parts of the library is that it is for everyone. The CEO to the janitor. Anyone is welcome. In my location, that does mean that we will get homeless people. That is fine. If they are causing a disturbance, they will be asked to leave just like anyone else. But otherwise, come on in. My area also has an opioid problem, and the library will see overdoses every once in a while. I have administered naloxone twice in the last three years at my job. We do community outreach to try and combat this. One of my friends has recently expressed interest in becoming a librarian. I was telling him all about school, Master's degrees are becoming more and more required, it was for me. Jobs, etc., and how the library has become a real community resource for those in need the past few decades. 
He asked what I meant by that, and I told him that pretty much what I said above. He said that that's disgusting, and that he wouldn't allow people like that to come into the library, and that the library should be for good people only. I was shocked. I've never known this side of my friend. I bluntly told him that if that's how he thinks, the job isn't for him, and that his attitude was a horrible one to have. Well, he blew up at me, and then made some vague statements on social media about people who try and ruin your goals. A mutual friend reached out and said that I was being rude. I really don't think I was in the wrong here. Honestly, I feel crazy. Was I wrong to tell him that? Am I the a-hole? I think that it really does sound like the wrong career choice for him, because I don't feel like you should be segregating libraries like that, especially if they're public libraries, like this one that OP is, you know, working in. And having compassion in this field is probably the biggest asset you can have, I imagine, because you're there to help the community. You're in the field. You know what you're talking about. You know what it takes to succeed in that field. You're not wrong for telling him that. He's the one denying reality. He's the crazy one here. You're not the a-hole. Edit. He's especially interested in being a public librarian. Second edit. I've been getting a lot of comments and messages on this. Yes, many librarians have master's degrees, and most positions will require you to have one. My specific master is in archive preservation, but I made the switch because I wanted to work with the public. Librarians do much more than checking out materials or telling a seven-year-old where the Magic Treehouse books are. You do budgeting, research, program development, teach classes, a million and one other things. Children's librarians do even more. There is nitty-gritty stuff here. It's a professional field. And final edit, please stop messaging me for my location. I'm on the Upper East Coast of the States. That's all I feel comfortable saying. And another edit, it appears people think that I condone drug use in the library. I do not. If you are found doing drugs, you are banned. I am prepared for the side effects of doing drugs, namely an overdose. Not the a-hole. Crap attitudes don't get you anywhere in life. It sucks that he can't see that. His attitude and statements were so upsetting. I had no clue that that type of ideal was in him. Pretty sure I'm done with the friendship. Good for you. You don't need that kind of negativity in your life, not the a-hole. And good for you. He will sabotage his own dream and blame you for it. Don't let people like that waste your time with their BS. Yes, especially if his dream is to work in some fantasy hallowed place of learning and intellect, open only to the worthy few. What a horrible attitude. Public libraries aren't exclusive for the elite. I dare say most of the actual elite don't even step into one, unless for some fundraiser dinner where they are being honoured. Not the a-hole. When I was homeless, the library was a godsend just for daytime shelter. They are one of the only free inside spaces for people to enjoy. Libraries are so helpful for so many people, and I'm glad they helped you out when you were experiencing homelessness, and sounds like you're in a better spot now. Yup, got help and a job I still have, and have had my own apartment for several years. Amazing. Good for you, dude. Not the a-hole? He would be the kind of librarian that turns people off from going to libraries by letting the power of it get to his head. Oh, he definitely would, and that small percentage is just the worst, especially when they turn kids off of the library. Lol, the kids and I have a funny relationship when I have to sit at the desk. Apparently, I'm a dictator for not allowing WrestleMania in the back corner. <laughs> They're great. Okay, and I think that's where we're going to end today's episode, guys. As always, I do hope you enjoyed it, and maybe even learned something from these stories. Just want to say a quick shout out to my Patreon subscribers and my channel members. You guys should be on the screen right now. If you do see yourself, I want you to give yourself a little pat on the back for being amazing, and supporting me on this channel, this uh, little journey we're going on on the YouTubes. 
I really appreciate it, and you guys enable me to do all this amazing work. So if uh, you do see yourself, I love your face and I'm happy to see you. Also guys, if you want to pitch in your own support, you don't have to, but channel links are down in the description below to support the Patreon, the channel membership, whatever you want to do. It's kind of like tipping me if you feel like I'm doing a good job on this channel. I will be opening up avenues for content on those in the future. Just right now I'm kind of bogged down and stuck in Ireland, but you know. It is what it is. Anyway guys, with that said, I do hope you have a wonderful day today. Whatever you're up to, I'd love to know down in the comments below. I do hope you have a good day, night, sleep. Whatever you're up to today, tell me, and I'll see you in the next episode, guys. Bye.